Uh, hi, my name is Baltazar Montoya, and today I'm going to be talking about rhythm, melody, and harmony, and how it pertains to musical ensemble, and how it pertains to you in your life. Uh, not to be too cheesy, but I'd like to start with a question. Uh, do you think you can live without rhythm? And if you answered no, uh, you're right. And that's because anatomically, our hearts beat at a specific rhythm and tempo, and any deviation from that tempo it's, it can kill you. Uh, it's called irregular heartbeat. It's a condition. And I find it amazing that a rhythm, which is an intangible concept, but we yet still feel it so deeply, it can keep you alive. It literally keeps you alive. And to expand on that a little deeper, when musicians are playing in a musical ensemble, they, their hearts sync up. So when they're playing together, you know, they're really communicating through the music, but they're also communicating, uh, I guess you could say, anatomically. They're communicating as one. They are one person. They're one being, one mind, one heart. That's amazing. You know, that's something when you listen, you hear emotion coming through the instrument, but it doesn't change what you're hearing. You still feel it as deeply. Nothing can possibly fix that. Nothing can not fix, but nothing can possibly surpass that. And, but to truly understand the meaning of rhythm and how it pertains to us, we have to go back in time to the medieval age, about 400 AD. And back then, uh, they had a, the first genre of music, you could say, was Gregorian chant. And this is where you had a choir, a chorus, and they would sing a tone uh, for a director, and the director would change it on his own, kind of his own, whenever he wanted. And so that doesn't sound that difficult. But when you actually do it, you don't have a meter. And what meter is, it's the way you count music. It's one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. And so without that, they were still able to change their tones perfectly after a few practice runs, of course. But they were still able to change at the same time and keep the same timbre together, stay in harmony. And that's extremely difficult from a musical standpoint but it's still amazing with the same concept that their hearts were in sync. And even further ahead in the musical timeline, we hit the Renaissance. And with the creation of instruments, it allows the musicians for more direct communication. But it also allows for the creation of a meter, what makes it all the much easier for them to communicate. It, make, it makes it all the much easier for them to express their ideas as deeply as they want to. And even further ahead in the classical and romantic eras, these musicians began to figure out the different beats of the meter. For example, in classical and romantic music, um, they usually accented beats one and three. So one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, because that's what people wanted to hear. They liked that, and the musicians and composers noticed that. And just to show you a little bit of what I mean, I'm going to have Alex here uh, play a little classical excerpt by Chopin. <laughs> Thank you, Alex. <laughs> and I'm not sure if you heard that, but he was doing and so he meets up at those beats. And I mean, that doesn't sound that amazing, but back then, it was revolutionary that a composer knew to do that. It's so mathematical, it really, it entices your brain, you know? And so that's something that can't be beat. You, that they could actually figure that out and put it for the musicians to play and to really emphasize. But even cooler for us, especially in the modern era, uh, fast forward a little bit further on the timeline, we get popular music that emphasizes beats two and four. So it's one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. And now today, that's what we live with most of the time, with popular music, mainstream music, hip hop, rap. That's all we like. It's two and four. They really emphasize that. They call it backbeat because the, the kids today like that because they can dance to that. Now, I'm going to show you a little bit of what I mean. So one, two, one. I want to do you for
Thanks, guys. Uh, just so you know, this is Alex Favell, and that's Elliot Moon, and they're the best musicians I know. Thanks, guys. <laughs> so you can see Alex. Okay. And so that idea of two and four, it's so important to us because today we live with that, but we have to understand where it came from, and it comes from those years of musical history and the past. Should I keep going? <laughs> So uh, that comes from the past and years of musical history and training. You know to clap on two and four because for the past hundred years or so, that's what they've taught you. So when the little kid goes up to the drum set and he hears a band playing, he knows to clap on two and four because he feels it. He feels that emotion that comes with that offbeat. And so that, that's something that, as musicians, it always really fascinates us that a beat can emphasize, or I mean will emphasize the character of a piece. If you play one and three, you feel it's a little more rigid, a little more mathematical. But when you play two and four, everybody knows it's time to play, it's time to have fun. And that's the cool part. We know that as people. And we, we, nobody has to tell us. We know that because of those years of training. And after that, uh, I'd like to say a little something about my dad and the way he taught me to play my first instrument and how it relates to the way I play and the way I express myself with, with my instrument. Um, the way he taught me, he taught me the clave. It's an African Cuban rhythm and instrument. I would have brought it. Uh, but, uh, so it's a, it's a block, you could say, a wooden, little wooden block. And you clap it on beats. It's the off beats. It's the off beats of a piece. And it's used mainly in Latin music. And the, the way it goes, and it's two, three clave. It's one, two, one, two, three. One, two. One, two, three. And so the way he taught me, I mean, there's nothing hard about that, but the way he taught me was the most amazing thing because he sang it to me, but the specific way he sang it to me. So he sang it to me emphasizing what's outside and instead of the rhythm itself. So what I mean is, uh, and so I mean, that doesn't sound that cool, but as I grew up as a musician, playing with different groups, different ensembles, I learned that the way I played it was characterized by that because I like to fill the holes of pieces. I like to play very busy, very animated, you could say. And that's the way he taught me. It's like coloring the outside of a coloring book. And you color the outside and you see what's inside. It comes out a little more clearer, but you're also aware of what's around you. And that's extremely important in music because it allows you to communicate with different instruments that maybe aren't your own, but are nonetheless still pertain to your ensemble and they're still extremely important, just as you are important to the ensemble and they're listening to you. And you guys may not know it, but you're listening very deeply as well. And melody and harmony, when I refer to that, you know that uh, based on those years of training. I keep referring to that, but it's the truth. We're a lot like Pavlov's dogs, where we're trained to know certain sounds and recognize that. For example, dealing with the idea of resolution and harmony and melody, we know uh, the ba most basic, perhaps, uh, most basic resolution of all music, which is six, seven, eight. If I were to sing it to you, uh, you would know it's the last note. I mean, I just played it, but you would know what that is. And that's based on those years of training that have taught you this is correct, this is right. I mean, you still deviate from that. That's how we get those new musical styles. But you still know where you came from. Likewise, dissonance. You know when that something sounds bad. Dissonance is just so, when something sounds bad to your ear. And you know that based on those years of training again over and over. But it's the truth. It's amazing. So when I play, uh, for example, I play the Devil's Interval. I play a tritone. It sounds a little, it clashes. It's tension. But if I just put, put it into perspective and I play it a little clearer, I guess you could say, it sounds beautiful. It's a seven chord. That's one of the most beautiful tones and chords in all of music. And it leads us to believe that we're all musicians and we all matter in a musical ensemble. We all can do things that musicians can do, but no one tries to, you know? And that's, that can't be right because we all understand the basic ideas, two and four, one and three. We know that subconsciously. You know the resolution, you know dissonance subconsciously. And the people who understand that and know that they're already musicians, they change everything. And they 
they change it and they revolutionize the musical industry. They get us to play Uptown Funk, they like it. They get us to play any type of music because they made it their own. And that's the most important thing in music, it's being yourself and being different. And that's what I think TED's all about. And thank you. Thank you.